Hey everybody, Matthew here from MiniWarGaming.com and welcome to the next video in the series of creating a new Hive Fleet. I've got Paul. Uh, if you don't know Paul, Paul is actually the, he's, he's a commission painter but he's not available. I am not going to give you his contact information <laughs> because I need him and you can't have him. There'll be stuff in the description below. Only one DM slot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's going to double his wages for you, <laughs> and that way I get more spots. Actually, no, then you would want to work for them. And, uh, no, never mind. <laughs> Whatever it is. So, uh, essentially, what has happened is I came up with the idea for the color scheme of my new Tiered High Fleet, because uh, as you may or may not already know, I've got 25,000 points of High Fleet Caron, which is my Kraken Splinter Fleet that I've been creating over the past 16 years. But I want to put all that aside and create a new High Fleet that's coming from the Segmentum Pacificus which is the west coast of the, the galaxy. As the new 10th edition 40K, if you're not familiar with the lore, essentially High Fleet Leviathan has now popped up even over there, which is terrifying because now it's, it's closing that, you know, it hit from the one side and now it's sitting from the other side and goes romp, nom nom galaxy. So creating a High Fleet that is maybe a splinter fleet of Leviathan or something else, the lore will be revealed in a narrative campaign. But uh, even though I came up with the basic colors, Paul did the hard work and basically went through what all that would mean when it comes to paints. And he also had the hard job of making sure that he documented it all and chose things that were easy enough to do so that I could have other painters work on it too. Because we're talking 20,000 plus points yeah. and I need, I need them done quickly and Paul can only paint so fast. So I have other painters working on it as well. And so, but Paul's the one that basically like, he tells them how to do it. So, step by step. Step by step. I thought it would be fun, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought it'd be fun to actually learn how to paint them myself. That'd be fun. Yeah, because what I have right here, if I've pre assembled, is a couple Carnifexes, but this one specifically is Old One Eye. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, near and dear to my heart because when I originally painted my other ones, because I did actually paint the first many, many thousands of points of Tyranids before I was able to afford other painters to help and, and grow to where it is right now. One of the things I did paint was Old One Eye. Mm -hmm. And even though all the other stuff is painted better later on, I'd always bring that model out and play with it. So I figured in my new army, I should paint Old One Eye as well. Mm -hmm. And that way, if I paint nothing else, I can still say I helped to paint my Tyranid army. Like the made with recycled plastic <laughs> or made with real fruit yeah. gummies that my kids eat sometimes. And it makes you feel better because look, it says made with real fruit. It's healthy. Yeah. Oh, it is only like 3% real fruit in there. But whatever, still made with real fruit. So do you still have that old one eye? Oh, of course. Nice. Of course. Uh, maybe we'll edit in a picture right here. Yeah. We'll see if Michael catches that. And so, <laughs> so yeah. So we're just gonna be painting all day. We'll make this into a video, mm -hmm. and that's basically it. So the, I will say right away though, we've skipped the steps for this video of assembling and priming it black. Mm -hmm. So that's not what this is about. We're just gonna go into the painting. So that's uh, that's yeah. all good. Let's get our let's get our uh, painting lights on. I'm going to turn that, and okay. the first, okay, then I'm just going to kind of let you start talking. Sounds good. Okay, so an airbrush isn't essential for this paint scheme, but I used it because I really like how smooth the, the paint goes on, and um, I find that I can get a little bit more control. Now so, you used it just for the initial priming though, right? Yes. Not yeah. for all the rest of the painting. Yeah, so this is the only stage that I used it for because I wanted it to be as approachable as possible yeah. in case other artists didn't have an airbrush. Uh, you can use a rattle, rattle can just as easily. Um, and if you were to use the rattle can, um, I would probably use one of the contrast paint rattle cans just so that it um, helps flow things better. Um, and I'd probably go with the cooler color just because this is uh, a plain white that I'm using, so it's a little bit more on the cooler spectrum rather than like a warm ivory or something like that. So I just use a little Vallejo surface primer and I add in a little bit of artist's white ink, an opaque white ink. Um, I've used uh, Liquitex, I've used this one, Amsterdam. Um, most of them are pretty similar as long as you get like a, a decent artist quality one and then I usually, when I'm airbrushing, I start with a little bit of thinner first. I just find that it, um, if you start with the thinner, it clogs less. And for this, I go kind of one part um, airbrush thinner to two parts paint, and then like a drop or two of ink. And the ink I just find helps make it a little bit thinner still. 
So it just helps a little bit more with um, keeping things nice and smooth, not as speckly. But with, with Tyranids, I find that um, a little bit of speckling is okay too, especially with the big monsters. It gives a little bit of texture. And right now I'm just back blowing to mix the paint. So covering the tip and mixing it and testing it out on my skin a little bit. And um, yeah, so with the Tyranids, that I did, I tried to kind of avoid um, the major carapace areas, uh, but still give it kind of a sense of directional light from above. So I start kind of with the upper upper limbs. Ooh, it's really showing the mold lines that I missed. Oh, that's okay. When we put that uh, contrast paint on, it'll go away. Army painting does require a different kind of discipline. I find that for commissions, it's really conducive to that because you can do things in batches. You can assemble everything. Like if you're assembling three kits, you can assemble like three of the same guy at the same time. And um, you get kind of a feel for what parts go where. Um, so it's, it's good for efficiency, but I definitely love lavishing time on specific miniatures. Mm. So this batch that I'm working on right now, I can show some of the miniatures later, has been nice because I'm working on some bigger monsters. Yes, which I would want you to put more time into, right? Yes. Like I, when, I, when it comes to hiring commission painters, you know, we can, we're gonna throw in all sorts of little tidbits. Maybe we'll break these down into other little videos. But when I hire commission painters, I actually don't want them to spend too much time per model mm -hmm. because then I have to pay more. And so it's, it's a fine dance between. So can I do a little bit of spray on him while this while first starts drying? Yeah, go for it. Usually I do a couple layers just to get that layer nice and bright um, so that the contrast paint shows really vividly through it. So I'll do one, one layer that's kind of like a light gray with the white paint. Yeah, no, when I'm looking for commission painters, I want them to spend the right amount of time. So I've had, I've worked with hundreds of commission painters over the years, like actually hundreds. I, I think it's in the four or 500 at least. That's crazy. From all around the world. Um, I work with a lot of local painters now because shipping obviously makes things a little more expensive, mm -hmm. but it's worthwhile for some bigger projects. Um, but one thing that I would look for, because people would ask, well, how much should I charge? Because most of the people I work for, or that I, I hire to do this, are just like one man. You know, they do it from their home, that kind of thing. There's, there's, only, there's very few commission painting studios that employ like several painters at the same time. Some of them are just one person. And so they have a hard time with the business side of things, like what should I charge, how should I charge? And I'm like, you know what? I can give you numbers, but what it comes down to is how fast can you paint good enough? If you can paint really quickly, good enough. You can charge a lot per hour. Um, but if you're a slow painter, you gotta charge less per hour, otherwise people won't rehire you mm -hmm. when all of a sudden it costs so much to get certain amounts painted. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Like People can only afford to, to spend so much. And some painters will be able to break into getting people to spend a lot of money with them, but for the most part, when you're starting out, that's the thing. You have to learn how to paint lots of stuff quickly. Mm -hmm. That the first layer is done, I'm gonna go back in, and things have dried nicely. So, and you can always use an air or uh, a hair dryer to speed things up a bit more, if need be. But um, this one's in a good spot right now, so I'm just going in and touching it up. And so you can see kind of the difference. It goes from a light gray to more of a bright white, and that's the white is what you really want for contrast paints. So you can see here the difference between this guy and this guy. Yeah, it's much brighter. Yeah. Um, and on the larger monsters like Carnifex's Hive Guard, the Tyranifex, um, and the Turvagon that I'm, I'll show later, I actually do a hybrid approach here. So I do the, the Zenithal, and then I actually go back in and dry brush um, lightly to catch the raised details, especially on the armor plates that I'm avoiding right now, um, because otherwise you wouldn't see any detail. And we don't want that. Yeah, so what I want is not a, not a pure white with this airbrushing, just very nearly a white, and then bringing it that last like 10% 
with the um, brush by hand. We'll give the scar a little bit more just so that that's... Yeah, it's gonna be more fleshy. Yeah. Give it more focus. Yeah, so when it comes to the color scheme too, I saw lots of cool color schemes, but I had to choose one, like you said, that had high contrast because I knew it was for camera. Because I've seen lots of, like I remember seeing one that was like a black color scheme and it took really good pictures to make it look nice. Mm -hmm. Because the moment your picture wasn't really, they like, didn't have a lot of light, it just looked like an unpainted miniature. Whereas in person, you'll look at that and your eyes are way better than the camera, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. Um, they can adjust the lighting a lot better. They, they adjust way better to everything. They can work in low lighting. And when you look at that, yeah, it looks fantastic. Mm -hmm. So that's it for the dry brush, or er, for the uh, airbrushing. Um, I'm gonna take a few minutes to blow dry them just to make sure that they're really nice and dry. Um, usually I just let them sit overnight because it's um, with primer and ink, they can be a little bit fragile, but we'll, uh, we'll get them blow dried and they'll be good to go. All right, what's next? Okay, so Here now we are going to do some dry brushing. You can get brushes that work really well as a dry brush from uh, the drugstore or the dollar store. You just get makeup brushes. Oh yeah, um, yeah these two kind of look like makeup brushes. Yeah, so anything that would apply like blush or eye, uh, eyeshadow or any, any of those like powdery kind of things. So um, these are expensive ones because uh, I'm a sucker and I wanted to support <laughs> some other folks and um, yeah, but they're they're really nice, so I like using them. Um, they're the brushes from Artist Opus and they're the Ninjon ones. Cool. What we do is I use a heavy body white paint. Um, you can use any white paint. It's just this one I find works well because it's like a cheap version of like a, the dry dry paints from Citadel. Um, it's just less water basically. So we just do a little bit because a little bit goes a long way. And um, we start by just kind of damp your brush a little bit. On, Is there water on that? Yeah. So you want it, the, the bristles kind of damp, not dry, um, because what happens is you end up with that chalky look. So if you keep your, your brush tip just ever so slightly moist, you pick up just a tiny bit of oh, paint like that. I took up way more than a tiny bit. And then you kind of go around in circles like that until almost nothing's coming off. I wiped a little bit too much off. But then you can kind of test it on your hand or on your, if you have a texture board, so like an old board with lots of dried up paint. Where yeah, I saw a video off. recently, somebody making one of those yeah. where you actually like test your dry brush on it. So, and then you just kind of lightly go across the details. So, so like when you see over here, have I taken enough off? Yep. Yeah, it looks okay. like it. So I'm just going up. Yep. I yeah, so I, 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 I like going off. across the armored plates. Um, oh, I thought I took too much off and then I put more light on it and realized. And these kind of sections so that it kind of acts as an edge highlight, but way faster. <laughs> because once the um, contrast paint goes on, most of the black area will be very, very dark green. Um, and then the spots. So it's just kind of a feather, feather touch. Um, Cause I try and build it up in a couple layers like I did with the white, just so that you don't end up with like streaks. And if you end up with streaks, the second layer will kind of help hide those. And you're going against the grain here. Yeah. It's like yeah, petting, a you, cat, petting a cat the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> petting a tyranid the wrong way sounds a lot more dangerous than petting a cat the wrong way. Well, depending on the cat. I don't I know, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know cats? <laughs> So again, just kind of loading up a bit. Do you do it more than once? Um, the dry brushing? Yeah. On yeah, the same so, uh, so usually what I do is I kind of give the whole thing an all over. Um, and then while the other parts are drying, um, just kind of building it up. And then, yeah, I, I usually do, especially on the bigger monsters, I'll give it another pass to really have those edges. How am I doing? Brighter. Too Good. much, too little? No, well, because with the with the armor panels on the Tyranids, you get kind of some striations, like some natural lines. Yeah, it actually looks like what I want it to look yeah, like in the end, which exactly. I know most of that's going to get hidden by the contrast mm -hmm. paints. So for the Termagants and stuff like that, um, it works really well because you, you only really need to do 
one one highlight to bring it up to like a really nice tabletop level um, because these these lines are already kind of built in right um, that's how it worked out with uh, the last batch that I did for you guys so I'm just doing the legs and the arms here because there's really nice texture on Tyranids they take it really well dry brushing yeah anything that's like more natural yeah as opposed to armor on Yes. A space marine, which you want everything to look crisp and clean. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can see some nice lines forming there. Normally you wouldn't want to see, um, see lines like that on like a smooth surface, but because we're doing this kind of jagged, rough uh, Tyranid armor, it works really well. Yeah, it does. Gotta get one of these brushes. This works way better than when I dry brush. It's the the biggest thing is to just get a, a chunky, um, a chunky, wide around rounded brush. Um, I don't find I mean the flat ones work okay for certain things, but I find like if you're looking for an all rounder, you you want an all rounder. So you can see here, there's we've just caught some more of these edges and things, and you still get a nice sense of the light. So. That's, that's the way that I've been approaching them. And especially on these bigger monsters, it's just, it's fun to see what level you can get to. I'm just doing a little bit of an edge on this scything talon. And then we're gonna move on to the, uh, the flesh tone after, after we get Matthew up to this I think I'm stage. done. I need to go look. Great. Critique it, please. Hold nothing back. Yeah, so you can see on the armor here, you can see the same striations. I would say on mine, I don't know if it shows on camera, but you can see a little bit more definition in the muscles. So I would just go a little bit heavier on right. like the arms, um, just where the ridges come. So you can see a little bit more definition like kind of in here. See how it catches? Yeah. yeah. Curious how much of that will show through once we start slapping on contrast paint. The hardest part that I've found with the contrast paint so far is that um, there's quite a variation in the range. Oh yeah, where some coverage. are way darker. So some things are like almost opaque. So something like um, the, blood I, angels, I, the blood angels red. Yes, I know that because I use it on one of my guys. I'm like, oh, I think I want his pants to be red, and it's like, <laughs> I'm like, oh wow, they're solid red now. Yeah. Like maybe I should have thinned that one down, but I kind of I didn't know that. I didn't know. I thought all the contrast paints were designed to not need to be thinned down to just yeah. slap on, right? So how do you clean your brushes? Um, so I usually rinse it as much as I can um, with just plain. I we have good tap water where I am, um, so I just use some plain water. And then Dawn dish soap works well. Um, it's it's really soft on the the bristles, especially for natural hair. Is there some in this thing right here? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, so. And then what are you rubbing it in right there? Th this is more concentrated soap. There you go. And then just. And then I just go in circles on my palm, um, gets the rest of it off, and uh, yeah, just give it a rinse. And now, if you're if you get partway through a big dry brushing session and you're finding that you're getting kind of chunks coming off, you might need to dry the brush and then let it let it dry totally so that it's not wet um, when you go back to dry brushing. Thank you. Um, again, you just want it to be ever so slightly damp. Well, it looks cool so far. Yeah, so you have a nice, a nice base to work off of there. Okay, so what are we doing now? So now we're just giving the Plague Bear flesh a nice show shake. It, show it to the camera. It's, um, it's a really nice contrast color. It goes on greener than it dries. It dries to kind of a yellowish green, but it, it works really well to complement the darker colors that we're gonna use later for the, um, the armor panels and the weapons and stuff. What brush am I using? So, um, for the skin, because these guys are big, I would recommend using something like this, as long as it takes a tip okay. Um, no, actually. Yeah, some of mine are pretty beat up. I would take the, the biggest one, the, yeah, probably this guy. Yeah, so this one, this one holds a good tip, but it's nice and big, so 
it'll be um, it'll be able to hold a lot of paint so you're not every 10 seconds going back and getting more so yeah we're gonna go like I said with straight this from the pot plague bearer flesh straight from the pot um, I, I tend to keep my brush a little bit uh, on the wet side just so that if I need to um, if I need to mop up a mistake really quick it's it's a little bit easier so um, what I normally do is I start in kind of an inconspicuous area so that if I've done something wrong, <laughs> I can notice it and go back and adjust it. So we're just covering all the skin with this? Yes. And avoiding hitting the carapace? Yep. So if you hit the carapace, it's not the end of the world um, because the darker green will cover up well. That's the other thing with uh, contrast. I work generally from light to dark so that um, if you do make a mistake, um, on something like a, a tabletop model or like if it's somewhere that's not very obvious on the model, you can just paint over with the darker paint and it kind of hides it. So that just comes with knowing like what paints hide other paints. And because they're all green, it's not gonna drastically change the, uh, the final coat. So how do you keep your contrast paint from being blotchy? So working fast, and in small areas. Um, and if you want to think about it like you're spreading a puddle and if like pretend that you don't have the paint pot and you need to use the puddle itself to paint. So you're moving the puddle around. Um, that's that's like how I try to think about it. Cause this is a little too splotchy, right? <laughs> So, so how do I get rid of that? So you kind of drag it. Just paint it somewhere else? Yep. And then go back and get more of it? Yep. Now with contrast. Or is it just the brush is too small? Uh, might be a little bit on the small side. But the, the thing that I find with contrast paint is, um, especially if you're doing it this way, I, I try to work from the top down so that the lightest parts are on top. Yeah, sometimes it goes on a little blotchy, but because of the way the uh, the surface tension in it works, it um, it kind of smooths itself out. But if you if you put it on too thick, it will it will go blotchy, especially on the bigger surfaces like the that are tails. just flat surfaces. Yeah. yeah, that's why it's it's not particularly good um, to use it with a brush on something like a tank. That's why you airbrush it on. Yes. It works spectacularly well through an airbrush because it's it's basically the exact right consistency and you can do pre-shading like we've done. So you you mean do, where you lay, like, layer it on top of itself? Yep. So you, you, can, you can layer it on top of itself, but you can also, um, with the airbrush, if you do something like this with dry brushing or airbrushing underneath, you can paint um, something like a red or a yellow over top of this white and it'll be really punchy. Um, and what I've seen people do with uh, yellows and reds is they will start from a brown or a purple base coat, like the whole thing is brown or purple or red for yellow sometimes, and then build up with white and then give the whole thing an all over yellow through the airbrush and um, it looks less dirty than if you used black with yellow because it just kind of goes muddy. Do I hit the little spikes there? No, or so we I- We're gonna paint those separately. Right? Yeah, so all these spikes and the hooves and the claws, they're all um, Dark Angels contrast. Okay, so we'll leave them kind of the same color as the carapace. Yep. Basically, the, the main difference with the, the carapace and the, the claws and the stuff like that is just the level of highlighting. Right. So the, the weapons um, and the digits and things like that, they all stay quite dark to contrast. And even so the vents or these, uh, these like cartilage packages on the side here. Yeah. I never know what to call them, but I've just been calling them cartilage. Um, <laughs> I, I paint right over them with this and then later shade them with Carolberg Crimson. Like a reddish kind of thing? Yeah. Now these guys don't have any guns, um, 
but on guns, I've been using Iand in yellow with uh, the Carolberg Crimson to shade it after, because then you get this kind of nice gradation from yellow to kind of an orangey. I think I'm doing okay. Yeah. Any, any advice so far? No. You want to let the contrast kind of do its job of like, you don't, you don't do one thick globby coat, like the initial kind of release told ideas for them told you to do, but you definitely want it to be thicker than you would normally apply paint because it's, it's like a halfway between a, a wash and a layer paint. What about his rib cage? Do I hit it as well? Yep. Yeah, the rib cage, um, everything that we basically focused on with the white. Um, when you get to the face, let me know though, because the teeth and the tongue we do differently. Well, and I've got a regenerative face for old one eye, which is the yeah. one half is blown off. So we're gonna have to do something for that too. Yeah, for the, the faces, I've been doing kind of a combination of Carolberg Crimson and Volumus, uh, Volupus Pink. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with um, contrast is it's quite um, fragile until it's been totally, totally dried. And even then it can rub off. So when I'm done with these guys, I whack them with matte uh, varnish. And when you're totally done. Yeah. Um, and for the big monsters, I might, because I actually handle the monster directly instead of just the base, like with smaller models, I'll probably hit hit it with a matte varnish and then do the layering um, on the armor because it requires quite a lot of turning the model in my hand and you don't I want just, to rub anything off. Yeah, because it it's hard with this this style. It is hard to patch things in if you mess up at a later stage. So if you say you drop some of the dark green on this skin tone. You just need to work quickly to mop it up. You can see here it's building up nicely in the recesses. Sometimes I go back and give it just a little bit extra. Just to darken the recesses. Yeah. And that way you end up with less of like a, less of a gray green and more just this sickly, plague berry kind of flesh. You can see the difference between this kind of yellowy green and this deeper kind of snot mucus green. And then when it dries, it looks completely different. Yeah. That's the fun thing with contrast paints because I've done things with contrast paints before and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I like that. I'll just let it dry. And when it dries, I'm like, oh, that looks really good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with the really big monsters too, I find that um, working in sub assemblies for just for like the arms and the legs works well. Like paint them before you assemble them basically. Yeah. These ones aren't too bad, um, but definitely like with the, the Tyrannofax and uh, Turvagon and stuff like that, I find I just kept the legs off um, because the body is in a pretty easily accessible kind of pose, but everything else just kind of gets in the way. Right. The, the I don't, hopefully I didn't make a mistake, but this is all supposed to be green here, right? Yep. Okay. The other thing that I do with contrast is I like to work, well, and just in general, I like to work um, from the inside of the model out, which basic, by that I just mean that I work on like the body and then the arms, um, because that way if I touch anything reaching into the model, I can kind of mop it up if I need to right. when I'm doing a later stage. So on the arms, um, I've decided to do this, these spikes, Plague Bearer, um, but not the leg ones, because they have kind of uh, a follicle, or not a follicle, but like a nail bed almost on them. Even, so, the, even the big ones on the tips of the, like down here? Uh, not the elbows. So the elbows will keep... Um, go darker. Will go darker. But um, yeah, any, anything that looks like a separate claw will, will keep that green. What about underneath on his chest? Do you do those ones? I, I keep those green. You mean this green? Um, sorry. <laughs> Everything's green. Everything's green. I keep those the darker green. Darker green, okay. Yep. Just to help them pop a little bit. There's not a whole lot going on on the chest, so it gives it a little bit of visual interest. But you could just as easily do it, Plague Bearer, um, especially on things like Termagants, because 
you're never going to see them from that angle. So, What about this part of the scything talon? Do I leave that? Um, I do this kind of hand part with the, the plague bearer and then there's another step that I do later to give it a little bit of a transition. I see, okay. Yeah. So we're actually going to wash, um, like th with the cartilage, we're gonna wash that hand uh, with the Carolberg Crimson. Okay. Yeah, it just gives it kind of a nice, like underlying kind of different texture. The advantage of working with a large brush with contrast too, is it just helps you move more quickly. Yeah, as long as you have that tip, right? Mm -hmm. That can give you the precision no matter yes. what size. I find that for a contrast paint, I really have been liking using synthetic, um, just because I find that if you use uh, sable or natural hair, uh, it just clogs it up and shortens the life of the brush too much. And they're expensive brushes, so I save those for things like layering and highlighting. All right, did I miss anything? I'm gonna go slowly around the model. I didn't do his neck yet in this face. Yeah, I usually work from the rump to the snout. Right, but you said there's something different we do about the face, so I was holding off in the face. Yep, so basically you can do the whole head other than um, the eyes and the teeth and the tongue. And what about like this blown off part of his face? Should I leave that? Um, so for that, I think what would look good is uh, if we do it with like the same way that we do the elbows and uh, like the hands. So if you wash it with the Plague Bearer, we can go over it with um, the Volubus Pink. So what am I not painting? Um, the teeth and the tongue and the eyes. Oops, I got the eye. That's okay. Eyes are easy to fix. What about the gums? Um, the gums you can do. Okay. I say that as if I could actually paint that precisely. <laughs> yeah, I'll just go along this 0.1 millimeter line right here. It's just fine. I'm really good at that. I'm known for my patience and exactness. The other thing you can do with contrast paint is, uh, like I just did on mine, is if you go over a little bit, you can just use your finger to yeah to pull it up. Yeah. Okay. I think, you know, I'm just gonna go back over and maybe I'll add a bit more to a couple spots. Uh, oh, no, I missed a whole spot in there. There's so many nooks and crannies in this guy. Yeah, that um, that is the tricky part with some of the larger Tyranid monsters. Pro tip for beginners, I'm sure everybody else knows this, having a very bright white light yes. is key. It's night and day, no pun intended to how well you'll be able to see and paint. I find that if you if you want to do things affordably, you can just get a desk lamp and plug in a good um, plant growing lamp because it's uh, it's got the daylight spectrum, which is what I like painting with. Yeah, you're, you're basically looking nice for daylight. Daylight's yeah. gonna be fine. Yeah. The bulb is where you want to spend the money, essentially. I think I've got it all. I'm getting pretty close here too. I'll need your professional opinion. So oh, I can see a spot. The moment I put it down, I'm like, oh, spot. That could be his name. No, that's old one eye. Oh yeah, true. He's got a name. Oh wait, I guess on the claw. Do you, should I be painting all this part of the claw? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So any of like kind of the knuckle meat, we're gonna get. When I'm uh, when I'm painting a big batch as well, I just keep the. I mean, as much as I like having a tidy workspace, I keep the last paint that I used off to the side so that when I move on to the next one, if I notice that I missed a spot, I can just go back really quick and add it back in. All right, take a look and critique. Awesome. Hold nothing back. Okay. I wanna know. Oh, we'll, we'll do this for continuity's sake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty close. The only, the only part that I'd say is uh, back at the tail you can see a little bit of splotchiness. Mm. Um, but I never really find that that's a big deal with these guys because it gives the skin a little bit of texture. Um, I would just say, if you wanna go back into here on the the inner spines, we'll keep those Plague Bearer. Oh, okay, yeah. I figured we'd put the Dark Angels on that, so. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's dealer's choice, really. Of course. Yeah. But, but you're the dealer. Yeah. 
So, oh, and I know. I know they're my turn is, but it's your scheme. <laughs> so I'm just gonna do it the way you do it. So now we are on to the next paint. Um, and what I would normally do at this point, um, if I'm working with something that has a gun, I would break out the I end in yellow and work with that. Um, I'm actually gonna grab the cannon now so I can show you. So this is one that I'm working on right now, the Tyrant effects. So Ooh, basically look at that. I go into the, all the gun parts and I give it just a, a plain old layer of I end in yellow contrast paint. And then I go back in to give it shading. I give it a, a decent coat with Carolberg Crimson and it gives it this kind of like dull orange look. So it's not super punchy, like um, I think there's a Fire Slayer orange or something where it's really quite bright. And I didn't want it to grab that much attention, but then I pick out these details with Aethermatic Blue. And um, yeah, I just find that that gives it a nice punch. So yeah. And then you can see in here as well, um, the teeth have a Carolberg Crimson, which is quite similar to this Volupus Pink that I used for the Venom Sacks and the Tongue and the Gun Anus. <laughs> Sphincter. And then, now it's, it's just shooting <laughs> crap at you now, right? Exactly. And then we have this disgusting <laughs> pregnant one. <laughs> the um, Termagon. So I, I did the same thing. I went in with the Iand in yellow a little bit to do the boil pimples. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's kind of a nurgly scheme. It I, is. I it like is. it. Yeah. But um, yeah, you go in there and then I used um, Volupus Pink on these sections. Um, what I did first was I, I wetted my brush and I, I went over the areas that I was going to paint and then painted with the Volupus Pink to give it this kind of um, patchy look. Um, so we can show this to the other painters if there's more of these. Pregos. Oh, there's, there, I'm probably gonna end up with two or three turbicons. Yeah. And there might be, maybe you'll find other stuff that you'd want to put that on as well. Mm -hmm. And you can see these guys busting out. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm pretty happy with how they've turned out. I put a little bit of Volupus on the I end and yellow on here as well to make it look really patchy and disgusting. Um, another really cool thing that you can do with Tyranids is um, use different finishes of varnish. So you could use like a, a glossy varnish on right, the belly to, give it kind to of make a wet. it slimy. Yeah. yeah. Yum. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Carolberg Crimson is the one that we're going to use um, for the joints and the cartilage and that kind of thing. And then we'll go with Volupus Pink for uh, the tongue. It just covers a little bit better. Uh, it's not a drastically different shade. So it works really well. Yeah. So now, now that we're nice and dry, we're gonna go back in um, with this Carolberg Crimson and we're gonna go and touch up all of what I call cartilage and vents and stuff like that. So anything like this with those little lines, like the very like um, kind of like it's a tear in the skin almost. Yeah, it's like a tear in the skin, but it's very tyranid. Like they all have these. Yeah. So we just go in with the Carolberg and you don't want too much because it'll flood all the detail, but you want to use a nice, a nice pointed brush and just keep it, keep it in the, the line and let the shade do its work. It'll sink into the recesses and it just gives it a nice little pop. Right, so if you, if you can hold on to the brush. Oh, you put a bit more than I did, okay. If you can hold on to the brush, yeah. That's the trick. And um, if, you, if you work quick, you can, if you find that you really globbed it on there, you can just wipe it off. So I go in to the teeth. Are you doing the teeth too with this? Yep. The teeth and kind of the, the lips now with the lips, I go back with just a wet brush without any paint on it, and I just kind of fade it. The lips. Or lack thereof, I guess. Now these guys are just kind of on the verge of needing to use Volupus Pink 
for the tongue, but I think that I'm really liking the way that the Carolberg Crimson is looking. You sticking that on the tongue too? Yeah. And it'll actually go on the eye as well. All right, I'm just gonna slop it on then. I say eye singular because your guy's missing one. That's rude. He's very sensitive about that. <laughs> I'm known for my sensitivity. Should I apply it? Because I have a slightly different model than you. Mm -hmm. What about all of this burnt out area? Should I apply it to that so and we'll do something else? I or? would I would do, um, like, get your brush, your brush nice and wet, and then, um, like, just dab it off a tiny bit on the towel, and go back into the shade, and then use it so it's a, a bit thinner, and then that way you can build it up. So because it's kind of burnt, I would do one layer, let it dry, and then another one, and possibly a third one. Just to really darken it? Yeah. Um, and not all over. Like when, when you're doing shades um, in that way and building them up, like, like you would with a glaze, you want to um, work your way into smaller and smaller areas. Can I see your face? Yep. Not your face. Not like turn it so I can see the side. Okay, yeah. I see what you did. Mm -hmm. That's the gums. So you can see on the camera, there's just some fading into the Plague Bear flesh yellow. I'll do some on the chin here. And it's really just to give it a bit more visual interest. So <clears throat> again, it's kind of dealer's choice whether to um, do these knuckles on the weapon hands. So what do you do? Basically, what what changes it for me is if they have these vents, um, like with these scything claws, so these little pockets with the vents that, that they have on the arms and legs, I leave them except for those vents. So you so hit the vents I'll, with this? Yeah, I'll hit the vents with the um, Carolberg Crimson. But on some of the other ones, like the ones with crushing claws, you can see there's no vents on here. So I add it to that whole knuckle. So, so this whole knuckle every, right here will everything cover? Everything below the forearm and between the claw. So everything and then, and then these ones we just hit right in the recesses. Yeah. So just to make sure I get it right, because this will obviously be hard to go back. So we're looking at anything in here, right? Yep, yeah, and anything and... below the forearm. If you can call it that. I need to like brush up on my insect anatomy. <laughs> should I Should I have put it on that right there? Or should I wipe that off? Um, that's okay. No, no, I want to know the answer. I uh, don't, don't, <laughs> don't placate me. So I usually go kind of right up to the edge, like right, right here. So I, I don't go up the edge of it. Okay. Yeah. So I'll take it off. I'm like, you got to tell me now <laughs> while well, I can still take Before it off. Before it dries. Yeah. Cause if I just get my brush wet and go back over it, I can get rid of it. And I do the ankle knuckle as well. The ankle knuckle? So right in here, the Achilles ankle knuckle thing. Okay. And it gives this kind of gross, almost bloody look when you layer it over the Plague Bearer flesh. Especially when it's wet, like when it dries, it's a little bit different, but that that would be a cool spot to do the, um, the gloss varnish if you're into that kind of thing. Just make it look a little more grotesque. Yeah. So, and then I leave the kind of cuticle section right here. Okay. And you don't need to drown the, the detail, but giving it like a pretty, um, pretty heavy layer so that it sinks into the, what you would consider the shadow nicely. So like anything below this kind of section here. So yeah, that, yeah that's, that's what I did. That's, that's a little bit of overbrush, but. Yeah, that's what I did right there. Yeah. Whew. All right, well, I'm gonna go around and find all the spots I missed. Oh, yep, found one already. And the thing with painting these schemes is sometimes you'll look at a layer in isolation and it will look like kind of suboptimal. But um, once you get all the layers working together, it really starts to come together. And then I go into the elbows and uh, like on the bigger monsters, you don't have to worry about this stuff for the little guys, but I go into like kind of the, the knees and the elbows on the big guys, just to give it a little bit of separation and interest. So anything between um, like the upper and lower leg or the upper and lower arm. Right, but how much of it? 
Um, well, in here, just the crease, but like on one that's more open, so you can see these kind of layers here, just right in there. Fortunately, those mold lines are still showing more than I wanted, like right there. Yeah. Anyway, right, both the arms basically. Should have scraped those off better. Didn't see them really well until you airbrushed them. There's lots of other places I did get, so thankfully, like the tail had a really big mold line going down the bottom right here. Yeah, the tails are notoriously bad for yeah. that. Well, I'll just have to accept it. Accept the imperfection of your painting. That's why I wore the shirt today. I'm not sure if you can see the whole thing. Yeah, you can. Right? True word, truer words were never written on a t-shirt. You gotta be okay with it. Okay, so um, are we waiting for this to dry or can we go on to the next step? Um, well, we can go on to the next step in some areas. We'll, we'll leave the, the larger spots like on the knuckles to dry more. Okay. Um, but yeah, we can move on to the Dark Angels for the chitin because we don't have any guns to wash. And okay. um, yeah. let's, let's do it. We've gone through the Plague Bearer Flesh for the skin. We've gone through the Carolberg Crimson for washing the knuckles and cartilage. Um, we didn't end up needing the Volupus Pink um, because these guys are just a little bit on the small side. Um, for the bigger monsters, you can use it. And now um, for all the chitin armor plating um, and the weapons, like the claws, um, anything like that, we've got Dark Angel's Green Contrast. Okay. Okay, any, so, any specific instructions besides don't um, screw up? Usually what I do is I start with a smaller brush on um, the smaller stuff, like the kind of um, arm barbs and uh, elbow claws and things like that. And then I go back in with a larger brush to do the bigger armor plating after. Okay, yeah. I've only got one brush, so I'm just gonna use the same brush for everything. I might lend you a bigger brush um, for the armor plates, because- This'll you, take forever. If you use too small of a brush, what happens is it gets really patchy. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. So with the hoove, I'm just kind of carefully pushing, like I push the paint with the tip. So you're trying to leave up. that area yeah. gray? <clears throat> it is gray, right? Um, I painted the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The oh, Plague Bearer Flesh. Oh, you did? Okay, I'll yeah. have to go back and do that. But the good part is, um, because this is such a dark paint, you can just do that after. Yeah. And it won't make very much of a difference. So we'll do these leg barbs. I try and when I'm holding it, I try as much as I can to grab it by things that aren't yet painted. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I- We'll do the back last, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I tend to do. Do we do the claws in this color too? Yep. The whole claw? Yes. Even the inside? Mm-hmm. Because later, oh, got a little. Did you make a little mess? Yep. Because later what, will highlight stuff? Yes. Just bring them apart? And that's why, so I just went to the inside of the model to paint that thing and I got it on the elbow. So as long as you work fast, it's it's easy enough to. Well, this is a darker color, so. Yeah, you, you do have to work quick. Now with this, with this one, I tend to work with um, the brush fairly wet so that it kind of thins as you paint. Ah. Um, <laughs> if there's okay if there's some variety. It mostly just saves. The bugs, right? Yeah, it mostly just saves a little bit of time when you're highlighting. And then sometimes you go too thin like that and you have to add a bit more. Okay, so now that I've done kind of the, the more finicky detailed spots, I'm gonna switch to my larger brush. Okay. So I noticed he only went part way up his back. Yeah, just because Did you, did you just kind of get bored and be like, wait, no, I want to use my bigger brush for this? Is well, that why you stopped? When, I, when I'm working with like 20 of something, if I, if I only do the spots that I really, really need to with my detail brush, I actually save a lot of time by switching to the big brush. That, that's the main reason is it's just economical time-wise. Like I, I could still do the, the exact same job with that one. Other than I think on the big back panels, it would be tough to spread it in time. It would just, it would dry too quickly and I'd end up with like- Really blotchy. Quite, quite a blotchy splotchy. Blotchy splotchy. Mm -hmm. Get this Stegosaurus tail club. All right, this brush. All right, let's do this big stuff. Oh, I can, I really missed that for the plague bear. I'm gonna have to go back over that. This whole part of the leg, I missed. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, now that yeah. now that we're further along, and I'm just like, oh, that's not supposed to be gray. It's all good. 
I can go back over it. I got a little bit of touch up I gotta do anyways. Ooh, I think I watered that down too much. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's one, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to get the feel for it. This, this is a little bit thin here, so I'm just, you can dab your brush dry and then yeah. go back in. I might need to shake that pot again to yeah, get some. I was gonna say, going a little too deep and getting, I don't wanna get on the side of the brush. Yeah. Oh, you got a little, uh, hair. you got a thing in there to mix it up. Yeah, I, I find that with some of the darker um, contrasts, especially, some of the sediment just sits on the bottom. So what do you so put in there? I just put a steel ball. You can use a glass a ball. ball bearing? Yep. I bought specifically the ones from um, Army Painter, I think, but you can you can get them cheap, as long as they're stainless so that they don't rust. I'm gonna do his back last. So the whole side and talon, or just the top? Yep, the whole side and talon. Because basically, the, the talon itself is almost all this like really, really dark green, and then you edge highlight it, and it just kind of pops. Got it. And then the armor on the back of it has a little bit more highlighting. You can kind of see, now that it's drying, you can see where the dry brushing was. Yeah, so you're right. I hope mine shows it like that. Well, I feel like I put it too light on its legs. You're better off to go a little bit too light than too dark because you can do a second layer. That's true. Um, but the whole point of contrast paints is not to have to do a second layer. Exactly. Two thin coats does not apply. That's right. Especially for Tyranids, he wants to do two thin coats. Yeah, right. Now, I have this, uh, what is this, kind of like a missile pod? Back those something? are spine banks. Spine banks? I don't have those, so I can just kind of go to town. So I, I'm i gonna paint right over them and then go back in with a small brush and just pick the whites out um, because I'd like to wash them with the Carolberg Crimson, but working my way around them wouldn't be an effective use of time. It'll be a lot easier to just go back in and pick them out. All right, I feel like I'm missing spots because so, now, much, so many shadows on this back. Yeah, with the back, I, I usually work like a panel at a time. Again, because of the drawing problems. Yeah, and I just, just learned this... that. That's what I just did wrong. Oh, okay. I had kind of halfway down the one panel, then I worked on the rest, and okay. then when I came back to it, I had, I so you see a line along it. You're getting ahead of where I think you are in my brain. Because <laughs> I, was, I was trying to let you know before. <laughs> I feel like there's another spot that I really missed. But I guess if I can't find it, then does it matter? You'll probably If find you fail it. to paint a spot, but you can never see that spot, <laughs> did you ever fail to paint that spot? Exactly. If nobody picks it up and looks underneath. Does it matter? You miss. Our food is here. Sweet. Are you done? I just finished. I think I just finished too, but I'm seeing a couple of white spots, but I think I want to let it dry. Yeah. The little spots are easy to look after after. Look after after? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's looking like something. He's looking yeah. like an unfinished model, though, because it's all solid colors, right? Got all the carapace done. I can actually see the highlights that I did on the carapace, though, the there dry brushing. Go. That's what you want. Yeah, that'll save some extra time. Okay, well, let's take a break. Yeah. We're gonna charge some batteries, literally, and then charge our batteries, mm -hmm. figuratively, and uh, we'll be back. Awesome. So. Okay, lunch is over. <clears throat> if I'm all of a sudden speaking with a lot more panting, it's because we ate a lot of food, <laughs> which is such a good idea to do after, right before you're gonna sit down for an afternoon and keep painting. With and hours not, of concentration. Right, and not like wanna fall asleep and have a little nap. Anyways, this thing is looking really good now that the uh, dark green contrast paint has, has dried. I can actually see all that dry brushing come through, which I didn't think was gonna happen because I couldn't see it when I was <laughs> applying the paint. Yeah, the glare gets in the way, right? Yeah, but uh, it's, it's actually worked out quite well. Um, I think I got a couple spots I gotta touch up, but other than that, I'm ready to go on to the next step. Mm -hmm. So, all right, what do we do next? So we want now to grab a kind of small medium brush, so something kind of in this range. I'd say, yeah, either of those will work well. Um, so, 
With the first layer of highlights, they're a little bit chunkier, you're covering a little bit more. Um, and we're actually gonna use a wet palette uh, just to keep the paint. Which nice brush are you using? Um, I'm using a uh, number two. I have a three. Every, every brand's a little different. I know, the, I know. The three's probably good. Three's what I've been doing for the whole thing. Oh, okay. So apparently you get the right brush and you can Work just course. use it for the entire thing, right? You don't need a whole set of brushes. Just get a number two or a number three. Yeah, I, this is a number one and a number three. So yeah. we'll start with three. I'm quite partial to um, these Green Stuff World <clears throat> number twos. They're, they're just a nice size. So we'll just let the paper kind of hydrate, make sure that there aren't wrinkles and stuff in it. I already pre-wet the sponge, so it's good. It's a necessary step with a wet palette. I try and work out all these creases or else you end up with um, the paper will like dry out. In those spots? Yeah. And then it curls up and then you end up with a mess. Okay, so don't really need that anymore. Um, basically for the highlights, we're gonna be working with, um, there's Nocturne Green is uh, the base color that I was using um, to kind of mix in with some of the other highlight colors. Caliban Green works decently as well, but you wanna mix just a little bit of Nocturne Green into the Lorraine Forest layer paint, um, because otherwise, if you go straight to the Lorraine Forest, it's, it's just a little bit too stark. So for bigger monsters, you need a little bit more in terms of layers, um, just because there's more surface. So with uh, termagants and stuff, it's like one, maybe two highlights in like the very most, like the most prominent areas. And then after that, you mix in increasingly more moot green until you have like pure moot green at some of the very most uh, prominent areas. So right. like right at the right at the points of the spines um, and the armor plates and. Um, I'm also, after I do the layering, I'm gonna pick these out, but it'll be a lot easier to pick them out after because, um, yeah, I don't wanna have to work around them the whole time. All right, let's do it. Yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> I gotta shake them all up. I don't have a Vortex mixer. <laughs> I can give you one. We have one that we don't even use. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I have been shaking them up, but this one separates a little bit more quickly. The Nocturne Green. Nocturne Green there. And we got some Lorraine Forest. Rinse our brush before we dip into the next palette. And then we finish off with some Moot Green. I love this color. It's just so electric and springy. And when you add it to this kind of dull palette, it really makes everything pop. So the first, the first color is kind of uh, a one part to two parts. So you end up with this kind of duller version of Lorraine Green, duller, darker. And then you go with just a very barely mixed Lorraine. And Moot Green is very strong. I, th I think that there's um, a decent amount of white pigment in it. So I find that the weakest of these three colors is the Lorraine. And by weak, I mean it's more like transparent. And each of these layers gets quicker because you're covering less and less. Like moot green usually only takes me a minute or two um, when I'm working on the final highlights. So there we go. So what are we doing? Like is it so this the, one to that one to that one to that one? Yep. Or this yep, one Yep, so we're just working one? left to right. But not with this one? No. Okay. So that one, the nocturne green is the darkest one and you can actually use it to kind of fix up any of the darkest areas. So, <clears throat> especially like 
once you do the mat, um, the mat varnish at the very end, it'll help, um, it'll help kind of unify everything because each of these paints has a slightly different satin finish. Right. But yeah, once you kind of nail it all together with the matte varnish, it really helps. All right, so. So when you're, I'll put this over here again for a second. When you're getting paint on the brush, I usually just work with a damp brush and you're, you're just wanting to get the first third um, nice and coated and then you can see, you can see it's fairly, oh. Yeah, I gotta be in the light. Right here. You can see that it's fairly transparent, but by the time you work up through the three or four layers, you'll have a nice coverage. So you don't need to do like two coats of everything. So usually I start on the back just cause it's nice and big, just to get a sense of where it all is. And you can use the edge of your brush to do edge highlighting. And with this one, you want it to be like decently wide because- Just to put layers on top of it. Yeah. So you're giving it kind of a nice, not quite all the way to the front of the panel, um, but like 90% of the way, like not quite touching the next one. I see, I see. Because you want there to be a little bit of a, a gap. But basically anywhere, anywhere you see the slightly lighter green coming through, you want to at least kind of touch that highlight too. And then once you start getting to the edge of the panel, you want to give it like four or five, six lines. To each side? Yeah. And it's kind of dealer's choice again, but I find with tabletop, if you go too small, they don't show up. <coughs> like on some of the, on some of the box art. Can I see it just yep. for a second? I can't see it. Oh, you gotta turn it towards me. Let me just. Yeah, Sorry, I'm. I've got the camera angle in my brain. <laughs> yeah, I know. You gotta show it to me sometimes. Okay, I see. All right. So yeah, it's fairly fairly subtle at first, and then, and I find that this this first layer takes the most time because you're kind of trying to figure out where everything goes and then the rest is just tracing. <clears throat> so it's not quite like dags, like you would see on orcs and goblins. Um, it's more more streaky than that, but it's not quite the, the pin thickness that you see on some of the box art. I do it on the outsides as well? Yep. Like out here. So the only place where I, I kind of changed my approach a little bit is on the um, on the stacks. I just do, I do a little bit less just because I, I want more of the emphasis to be like right on the body. So what do you do on the stacks? So with the stacks, I kind of rim highlight. So just edge highlight the rims. And then I might do like where these chips are, I might do a little bit of a, like one or two of these. They bring it down a bit, you mean? Yep, kind of like that. I see. But for the most part, they stay fairly dark. And because Tyranids are an organic based army, I really, I do a lot of variation in the line in terms of uh, like how long they are. So sometimes it'll just be a nice little short, quick line. And sometimes it's fairly long. There's no exact science to it really. So generally speaking, when, when you start moving to smaller um, armor panels, I do just less, less streaks. So I might only do two or three. You ever consider just dry brushing this part of it? I have. Without um, just doing all this layering? Cause when we did the dry brush of the white, mm -hmm. they kind of produced this effect anyways. Mm -hmm. So the, the only thing is that I find that you get a decent amount of overbrush into the really light areas. Um, with, with big monsters like this, you can do some dry brushing, but you lose that kind of striation look. Right. Um, but it definitely is something that you could probably employ on something like Termagants if you're careful. But so now with, with tabletop stuff, 
I, I don't highlight the, unless they're huge, like with the Turbagons and Tyranifexes and stuff, I don't really highlight the feet the because hooves. They, um, they get a dusting with uh, a powder, a weathering powder, so that it, would, it kind of blends in anyway. The things that are, excuse me, higher up on the model, like the head and the main weapons, those are the things, and the back carapace, those are the things that matter the most. Things you're gonna see more too. Yeah. Well, I'm doing my best. See, mine aren't as, quite as nice as yours, but. Well, it's definitely. They're yeah. there. It's, it's definitely painted, you can say that. Yeah, it's, it's painted. It's definitely painted. There's paint on it. <laughs> Honestly though, from like when they're on the table, they're not gonna look that different. No, no, yours are sharper. Yeah. I think that's the difference. It's just the crispiness. Yeah. But um, no, I'm happy with it. And honestly, I think I, I could have achieved that with dry brushing. Mm -hmm. Whereas I can't achieve what you did with dry brushing. Yeah. Part of me is actually tempted to you grab could, the dry brush right now and finish it off. Just see what it's like. Yeah, you know what, screw it. I'll do it to a small part first. Well, where, where did that dry brush go? And I feel like there's... Um, People are screaming right now. Don't do it! <laughs> What do you think? I'm killing it. I'm killing him. Which one should I do? This one or that one? Um, I would do the middle one. The middle one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So if you take a tiny bit, and then go on, not on the wet palette. <laughs> not the wet palette. <laughs> there you go. It'll be harder to tell um, when it's at the right point because um, yeah, because it's, it's green. <laughs> Getting that last little. Oh yeah, you see yours looks way better, obviously. Just that. But if I didn't have yours beside mine, <laughs> wow, yeah, yours looks way better. Just that last little pop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm happy with mine. And I, I'm watching I'm... you place the paint is nuts because I'm like, you can't teach me that. You just have, you literally have to just, you have to do the stroke. Yeah. Um, like. 10,000 times, and after that many times, after that many repetitions, you just do it naturally. Well, and it Whereas gets, I'm doing it, and I'm just like, oh, that was too wide. Oh, that went to the left. Oh, that went to the right. It gets to the point, too, where, like, tools are an extension of your body, right? Yeah, exactly. And the, the more, like, just a part of your finger something can feel like, the more accurate you can be, right? Yeah. Like you know exactly where that brush tip is. What I like at the end is like when, when I'm working with the really dark green areas, getting that little moot green edge makes them just feel sharp. Yeah, that's, I'm, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just going, I did the dry brush and I did the other colors. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go over and just add that because mm -hmm. I think that will make a difference. And it is, because it kind of hides that I was sloppy in the previous layers. I'll say it again, good lighting is key. I keep yes. painting and then finding myself away from the light and then I go into the light and I go, oh, geez, I missed that spot. If you can, multiple lamps is where it's at. With different angles. Yeah, like I have, I have fluorescence above and then I have a desk lamp to get kind of behind a little bit because when you're looking in, the light casts shadow. Like right now, this is kind of where it is for filming, but more ideally, I keep it a little bit more over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, so it's same direction as your eyes. Yeah. Yeah, you have to like turn it and go over to where the light is. Yeah, we're limited obviously for making a video. Yeah, drop the brush. Okay, so I'm gonna call him there. Yeah, me too. So I got them nice lines, good and readable on the, the dark green. <clears throat> All right, let, let me do the comparison. You can do it on camera in a second. Okay. Oh, golly. Look at that sharpness. That's hot. Okay, I'm not as disappointed in mine as I thought I'd be. No. And honestly, from from here, like, it's just that that final pass is the only thing that really makes the difference. Yeah. Yours is definitely way, way more precise. But it's, it's interesting to look at yours as precise, but is that better? And it's just different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. No, I I can see, yeah, yours, like I said, yours is definitely more precise. You, you show that you're able to mm -hmm. get the paint exactly. You can show it to the camera. Embarrass me. Well, and I think, I think I put a little bit more white on the carapace on yours, so, there's a bit more of the light green 
So there's kind of two different greens, right? There's like a, a pale green and then there's a kind of electric yellow green. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's good though. They, they look like they belong mm -hmm. them together in the same army. Yeah. And the thing is- From the different... side, there's almost, like there's not a whole lot yeah. of, uh... yeah. I think um, too, when you have to consider is that with the different painters painting, even if they follow all your instructions, exactly. there's, there's going to be some variation in yeah. precision and in <laughs> some of the choices. So before we go on to what you want to do next, can we do something with his, the broken part of his face? Yeah, so. What should I do with that? Should I turn it white, like a skeleton? Yeah, what I would do is take some of this Carolberg Crimson and uh, ignore the P3 label on this. <laughs> any, any good white will do. What's wrong with P3? Oh, P3, I love this white. I'm just uh, thinking for accessibility of being able to find it, it's a little bit harder to find. Oh, I see. Um, any, any good white paint is what I would recommend. Um, or you could use ivory if you want a warmer tone. And then you mix a bit into there. All right, next time, next time you're mixing with palette, do it on camera. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then what am I doing? Just grabbing some? Yep. And just putting that in there? Yep. Am I highlighting or am I just throwing it in? Uh, just highlighting. So this is, we just mixed a little gradation from Carolbird to white. Oh, I see, yeah. I'm just picking out yeah. the ridges. And you're really just following what is already there. And then after you've done that first pass, you go more to like a straight white and just do the very, um, like the most prominent ridges and stuff like that. And I'm actually gonna use some white to do the teeth. Mm. Almost like a little bit of a dry brush over the teeth. Yeah, and I, I, use, I use it fairly um, thin so that it's not perfectly white, because I mean, if they're, I mean, I don't really they imagine have they plan. have like eight foot toothbrushes. But well, no, they, they're always fresh off the, the ship, remember? Fair enough, yeah. Yeah, look at that. And you know what'll make it pop even a little bit more? What? If you go along the shattered chitin with the moot green. Which shattered chitin? Um, like around his eye. Just go around uh -huh. it a tiny bit along the edge. And uh, that little bit more contrast will really help it. Look like it's broken? Yeah. I'll try that. I don't have the precision that you do, but. It's an edge, so it should be easier to hit. Yeah, I think you're right. Looks like you do know what you're talking about. This is what I mean, like I'm really enjoying painting this. Mm -hmm. But once I'm done painting it, I don't want to paint another one. Yeah. I want to paint something else. Yeah. So, but I want six Carnifexes in my army. Because they come in broods. See, so. and the, the thing that drives me nuts is that, like, I know that I can go 10 levels further. <laughs> right. But I need to be like, okay, do it fast and do it well. Yeah. And then move on. That's right. Okay. Okay, so what's well, next? Um, have you done your teeth? Yes. Okay, well now, yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> have you painted your teeth? <laughs> um, okay, so now we just need to dot the eyes yellow, uh, like The eye, uh, excuse me? Oh yeah. Not so all of us are blessed <laughs> with two. <laughs> so we just give the, the eye a little, a little dot with Uriel yellow or similar primary yellow. Just to make it stand out. And uh, yeah, it pops really nice because we've washed the recesses with that Carolberg Crimson and it kind of gives it a little bit of glow. And then after that, I mean, you can take any of these steps further. You could even, if you wanted to, you could go back and highlight the Plague Bearer flesh, but that would take a long time for diminishing returns because we already have lots of nice um, highlights and uh, um, shadow from the dry brushing and the zenithal coat at the beginning. Yeah. Oh yeah, that really does. My goodness, he's terrifying. By golly, I did it, Miss Molly. I did it. Okay, so he's done. We're just yeah. gonna do the base now. Yep. 
I guess there's one thing we should have mentioned. He's not attached to the base. I find that Steve is the same way. Like he doesn't like attaching even like little models to the base, and that way you have more control over it. I do some of the little models because I just find it it's quick to like roll, roll the from side to side with yeah. like termagants and rippers and stuff. But any anything like lictor size and up, um, take like off the base. Monstrous infantry and up, I would yeah definitely take the base off. Okay, let's make the base. Okay, so. Now we're on to the final part, and I find that really a good base will go a long way to selling the kind of overall feel of the army. Um, and with this one, I wanted to keep it simple, but we're kind of using some specialist um, products just so that you get the most bang for every step. So I find these AK Terrains products are really good um, oh, you are for establishing um, just the the environment and like they have the color and the texture all in one um, and they come in a really big pot um, so they're a bit bigger than the GW ones for sure. You can do like three armies with this or a uh, an army table or something like that. Um, so I start with a good layer of the dry ground uh, so it's kind of this um, khaki color and then we move on to um, a kind of a patchy application once this is dry. This is pigment powder, and it kind of gives it this really nice dusty feel. So we go and apply it to some of the lower legs and the hooves and patches of the base. And then after that, the final step is to um, use some white glue. And um, if you have access to um, something like a matte scenic sealant, or I just made my own, so it's basically just, um, matte medium with uh, glue, like just white glue, and then water and some isopropyl alcohol, which helps um, get into kind of all the nooks and crannies and it flows better. It just breaks up the surface tension. And um, right here, we have Geek Gaming Scenics. Um, they make some really nice base ready stuff. So if you're not really into like painting bases, this is a really nice uh, material because it comes with like sand and flock all kind of mixed together. Um, so when you put it on there, it's got a really nice kind of natural look. And it's it's particularly good with stuff like historicals and Lord of the Rings, but I actually really like how it looks with this paint scheme. So we're gonna start. Let's do it. With this, open it up, I leave this layer on because otherwise it gets pretty caked into the um, into the lid and you can't close it. So I just keep the brush a little bit wet so that <clears throat> so that it doesn't uh, Stay. get too much into the ferrule. And if you get a little bit on the rim that's fine you can once once you've gone over the rim you can just use your thumb to wipe it off the edge. I actually find it easier to go over a tiny bit and then just clean it up or over a lot, mm -hmm. like I just did. <laughs> you can also use like a popsicle stick or something. You don't need to use a brush for this part. And the nice thing about these <clears throat> basing uh, pastes is that you can build them up and be pretty thick with them. So you could sculpt like little dunes or tiny little hills, um, or you can go pretty flat. But you kind of skip having to like glue sand down and then paint the sand and highlight the sand. You can dry brush this stuff as well. This one would look really good with like an ivory kind of off-white. But instead of dry brushing, I decided to use the pigment butters. How's my look? Good faster than me, you're making me look bad. I'll just lower your hourly rate, <laughs> we'll be fine. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Now we gotta wait for it to dry. Mm -hmm. so I'll just, I'll Normally that takes out. how long if you don't use a hair dryer? Um, usually, usually I do this step at the end of the night and just let it dry overnight, but um, if you don't go too thick, a couple hours will be good. So, I usually, unless I'm doing a ton of bases, 
I usually actually do the base, like all this part while it's on the model, because um, then I can kind of integrate the model a little bit more and um, have something to hold the base by. That's not the base. And, um, but yeah, you can do it separately. If you want to do like a hundred bases at the same time, it, it's a lot faster to do it with the model not attached. So that's another good reason to not attach the model when you're working. Awesome, so now we're waiting for it to dry. Yep, so I'll take them out and hit them with the blow dryer. Yeah, so now that we have the base paste down and dry, um, we want to take this Sienna Soil uh, base powder, or uh, pigment powder, sorry. It's just a little bit warmer of a color. Um, and what we do is we just kind of take this and just dab it around the base. But not we, uniformly. No, we want it to be kind of random, patchy. It's, um... Can you put it over here so I can do two? Yep. No, I mean the... Paper. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to help you with your base. I've actually used this stuff before on my Necromunda stuff. It's it's really great I love it. uh, for rust. Yeah. Um, because it's ultra matte and it just, it gives a nice, difference in color like you can you can really see under a white light how how much warmer that is than the, the basing paste put too much on so you can just tap it off and later on when you seal it with uh, the the matte varnish that it really locks it in because um, otherwise over time it kind of blows off but that's what you end up with and that's kind of what you want because if, if we go all over, that'll be the uniform color and we don't really want that because we have this nice um, scenic gaming material. And what I do with that is I take a little bit at a time in my fingers and I just kind of, oh, I should get a feel for where he's gonna sit. So he'll kind of go in the middle, right? Yeah. To, yeah, you want him to be yeah. represented by the base. Okay, so you want to kind of avoid where the feet go because this stuff is a bit chunkier. So we'll give him a bit of a pile that he's looking to come over. And then a bit of a pile that he's already come over. And I like working some of the uh, these kind of tufts that it comes with into it. It's called Scrubland. It's kind of a nice arid feel. So I like to think that these guys are halfway through devouring the planet. So it's kind of parched. There we go. So yeah, you just kind of carefully sprinkle it on. You don't want to go too crazy, um, but you want like decent coverage. So it's kind of a, a patchy little environment. And then what we do to lock it in is instead of putting white glue down first, I use this matte scenic sealant because it, it helps it adhere really well. And um, it is super matte. It does stink like um, isopropyl alcohol, but that's okay. So we just give it a few drops and you can see, you can see how it just it disappears into the recesses. You want to give it a nice little coat so that it locks down some of the bigger stuff. And the bushes as well, you want it to get all the way through so that they're held down nicely and they don't pop off during gaming. And I might actually put a little bit more kind of in between where his legs would be. More of the more scenic of the, stuff? Yeah, the scenic basing material. Yeah, there you go. My picture I'm this. I'm just, yeah. Oh yeah. So I'll give you this. And you, you just kind of lightly pinch the top. Yeah, perfect. You want to give it a, a pretty good dose. We're looking to cover the whole thing with this, right? Yep. So why not just spray it? Like put it in a spray bottle? Well, this, this penetrates down like right into the base and um, holds everything tight. Basically, if you, if you spray, it only 
it only goes on the top layer. So it'll it'll make kind of a crust, but it won't adhere to the base. I see. Now you can you can also um, put some glue down first, but I find that doing it this way makes it look more natural. Can I get some more, please? Yep. I'm just gonna do this real quick. And it looks like it's sitting a little bit heavy right now, but once it dries and evaporates, it'll go clear and you'll have a base to put your nids on. Am I putting in too much? No, nope, right about. If you go on even more, the, you'll probably end up with a bit too much. Right. So that's good. Maybe do another little drop yeah, on that bush. Say. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. So is this base pretty much done besides drying? Yep, you just need, we just need to dry it. And um, the, the rims on these ones are pretty clean because of the way we approached it, but you just give it a nice base rim and attach your bugs. Okay, let's take a look at this. All right. This one's mine, right? Yep. So now that we have the rock uh, base ready material on there and the, uh, the weathering powder, we want to just give another dry fit to make sure that uh, the feet will go where we want them to. Oh, it was this way. I'm like, oh no, it doesn't fit. It's looking pretty good there. And uh, yeah, then we just get some super glue and tack them on. Just straight onto the base like that? Yeah. Um, if, if there's spots that um, are looking like it'll raise it up too much, you might just want to move, like you can scrape a little bit of uh, stone off just with the pick. Um, sometimes I just do that just to make it a little bit flatter. And then, yeah, it just goes on. And um, once he's on, you can kind of blend in um, the feet into the base by using the base powder. Awesome. Okay, well, let's do it. Yeah. <clears throat> this is actually the glue that I like using. Gorilla glue? Yes, sir. just because it's a little bit more like a gel. So it, um, it's not like you need to be 100, 100% contact. So you don't find that this type of thing We'll stick to the super glue and then just peel off the base. Well, so I, I typically, like before putting the base paste on, I typically um, glue the miniature on, but just for like visual display purposes, I think it's easier to do it this way. But yeah, like if, if you're doing it personally, I, I would say to do it like reversed. Get the, the, model, the model glued on. on. Yeah. And then do the paste and then just, you get more, you get better contact, and you can use the, what do you call it, the plastic cement that way. Or I guess you can pin it too. Yeah, pinning works as well. It's just, um, like if you do pinning, it takes a little bit extra, extra time. Well, I missed a little bit of plague bear flesh if I look straight down there. I know, right? I keep doing that too. Every time I look at it again, I find another gray spot. I'm like, how did I miss that? I can do that while I'm holding them. Oh, I still have to go back and do these spines. And then after this, what, we spray it with a varnish? Yeah, it's just matte, matte varnish and that's Is it a it. spray or is it something you paint on? Um, just a spray can. And that hits the base too, I guess. Yep. And that'll help seal it in even more. But we're also gonna dirty up the, the feet yeah. to match the base. Is that just with the pigments? Yep. Yeah, and you just, you kind of, you're basically just trying to integrate it more into the base. Right. Yeah. Okay. Did you say that you had another thing that you wanted to touch up? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Like I can see, uh, like when I turn it upside down, there's a spot, but I'm not too worried about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we have the glue on there, hopefully he'll, uh, nope. Is <laughs> he falling off? A little bit. Maybe I should scrape it a bit more. I'm thinking of that too, because mine's not sticking. Like it is sticking, but it's not sticking. I'm almost thinking of scraping out the, yeah. the size of his foot. I'm thinking I'll do that. 
All right, well, there's top tip. <laughs> Glue it to your base first. This was the first time that I had uh, that you didn't? done that, so. You're supposed to show me exactly how you did everything. <laughs> I was wondering that too, I'm like, because my experience in the past is when I glued on top of it, it just peels off, yeah. and the base material peels off with it. It's those YouTube jitters, I got me. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, just make more of a space for his hoof. Yeah. And then we can, you can always cover it up with the stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I can see exactly where his feet are gonna go because it's got a little, little bits of super glue on it. There we go. It's okay, it makes a good story. Yeah. And then we realized we made this mistake. That part is always the can't, turning point of the video. Can't always go smooth. Yeah. Turns out Paul didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> And I learned a valuable lesson. Hire somebody else. <laughs> you can just keep going. Yeah, I'm just gonna seal this. I didn't want to reach in front of you. Okay, attempt number two. Hooves are almost a little bit rounded. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old model. Oh, I can already feel it. It's grabbing more. Yeah. Sorry, I'm shaking the table. That's all good. <laughs> I'm scrape off some of that stuff too. Okay, so now that he's attached to the base, we'll go back to the weathering powder And it, so if you if you glue the model down to the base uh, before you do the basing, you can do this all in one step. And that this just shows you why I don't do too much work on the hooves because it all ends up getting, getting covered, kind of dusty. Yeah. And I just had a little bit of touch up to do on his tail where I was grabbing. I got a little too handsy with him. This is actually a good opportunity to show a repair. So if you end up screwing up a little bit, you can just reapply the white that you started with or off white if that's the case. And you put a little bit in the middle, quickly dab it off and feather it in. And it should be minimally noticeable. It's really hard to 100% blend it in. We'll just call it battle damage. There we go. And uh, now we go on to one of the most satisfying things for a hobbyist, the base rim. Between base rimming and crushing your enemies before you, I think those are probably <laughs> some of the most satisfying moments. Yeah, it just kind of tidies it up and... Yeah. Um, okay, so do you need to blend into your feet? Or are you good? I already did that. Okay, sweet. So we're just putting black around the rim basically at this point. Yep. I think I know how to do that. Where's the black? Uh, just in the wet ballot. There it is, okay. And these should only need one pass because we didn't even get any zenithal overspray on them. Okay, look at that. Work of art. Oh, wanna. Oh, my. There we go. Two complete Carnifexes. Well, 99.9% .9 complete, because <laughs> we have one last step to do, right? The, uh, the matte varnish. That's right. Okay. So this is where we're gonna grab a spray can, and we're gonna spray the whole thing, right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go outside. Okay, so we're at the final, final stage. Yep. Which is, uh, applying a matte varnish. Matte, not gloss. Oh. That's important. Yeah. All my old models were gloss varnish and they're all shiny. You can do satin, but I prefer matte, especially for this particular scheme because otherwise the dark uh, armor really layers and yeah. it's 
No, no bueno. You can always brush on some gloss if you want a part to look glossy. Yes, the, the slimy stuff. Yeah, exactly. All right, show us how it's done. It's complicated. So short burst as you're seeing. Yeah, and you want to start off the model and move across it. You don't just go model, model. There we go. That's it? Yes, sir. Beauty. Nice and flat. <laughs> <sighs> oh, so much nicer in here. <laughs> yeah, so hot outside. We did it. There we go. Show, show off yours to the camera. We'll, we'll obviously take some shots separate from here. There. And, I'm thinking uh, that's the angle right there. Yeah, you got your nice old Carnifex, mm -hmm. and I've got old one eye to lead him. There we go. So, show off old one eye right there. Just be careful, he's still gluing to the base, so don't pinch him too hard. You get the, the nice gnarly face on there. Yeah. It's a classic model. Mm -hmm. Holds a dear place in my heart. Holds up well, I have to say, compared to new sculpts too. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, even though it's like a fourth edition kit, I was looking it up, fourth edition, mm -hmm. that's a long time ago. That's at least 15 or 16 years old. So when I got into 40K almost 16 years ago, this was the Carnifex kit. So mm -hmm. I don't know how new it was at that point. Um, my only thing I should think I should need to change is maybe add a little detail in the front of the carapace. Yeah, just because you you're face that, right? Yeah, because you're looking at that. Because mm -hmm. I'm looking at yours. Mine has the benefit of having the... Uh... Those barb missiles? Yeah, which gives it a little bit more. So I might I might touch that up and just add some streaks. Mm -hmm. Just because it looks unfinished. So I might do that off camera. Yeah. Or right now as we finish up this video. But um, but yeah, no, I'm quite happy with that. So thank you very much, Paul, for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, this is I, I hope this was a, a good video for you guys that you're able to get a little insight into the whole painting process. I know there's lots of painting videos out there. I was hoping this would be a little different and that um, in this case, you're watching somebody be taught that kind of already knows a bit about painting, mm. but is not really good at it. And uh, going through that, that thought process of creating a new color scheme and exactly what all goes into that and all the different tools and things and the things that you can skip, like we've made little mistakes here and there, or you can dry brush this instead of layering or, mm -hmm. It's really lot, lots of different ways to kind of come to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. So you can experiment with it and just have fun. And that's, I think that's the big thing for me is it's just like get past the, you have to be great at it. Just be okay at it. Be the world's okayest, okayest miniature painter. Because <laughs> that, that's, that's a title that a lot of people can take. You yeah. don't have to paint for very long to get that title. Uh, when you're brand new, maybe you're not that good, but it doesn't take very many miniatures before you kind of hit that stride and can do something decent. Yeah. And uh, that's impressive on the table once your whole army is painted. So thank you again, Paul, for coming in. Thank you. Um, and stay tuned for more videos about the creation of my new high fleet. Thanks so much for watching. Happy Wargaming.